Hi everyone, it's Professor Primerton. In this video, we're going to review logarithm functions. So in this section, we're going to first review the definition and the properties of a logarithmic function. And then in the next video, we'll talk about finding derivatives of logarithmic functions and also exploring applications in business, economics, social, and physical sciences that could be modeled by logarithm functions. So let's start with a review of logarithm functions and their properties. So before we start finding the derivative of a logarithmic function with a base b, we need to summarize some of the important facts that you may have encountered in an algebra class about logarithm functions. Logarithms are actually the inverse of exponential functions, so it's good that we talk about logarithm functions right after the section about exponential functions. And logarithms are also commonly used to express quantities that vary widely in size. So let's start with the definition of a logarithmic function. The logarithmic function, base b, written this way, log subscript b, so that's base b, of x. So what's inside the parentheses is what's called the argument of the logarithmic function. And the logarithm is just simply the inverse of an exponential function, also base b. So they have the same base of the logarithm and base b of the exponential function, where the exponential function is base b raised to the x power. The x must be a positive number. So what's inside the logarithm must be a positive number only. The base must be positive, but not equal to 1. So the way the logarithm is defined allows us to actually convert between exponential form and logarithmic form this way. So base b raised to the a exponent is equal to c. So this is what's called an exponential expression because it involves exponents. This expression is equivalent to this one in logs. Log base b of c equals a. So these two statements say exactly the same thing. Base b exponential expression, base b logarithm expression, a is the exponent on the exponential expression, a is what the logarithm is equal to, and then c is what the exponential expression is equal to, that's the argument of the logarithm. So c must be a positive number because that's inside the logarithm, that's the argument. The b must be positive because that's the base of the logarithm, and b cannot be 1 because that's the definition of a logarithm. So let's get some practice converting between exponential form to logarithmic form, and then actually evaluating what the exponent is. So example 1, Exponential to logarithmic form. Convert each expression in exponential form to an equivalent logarithmic form, and then determine the value of the exponent using either a scientific or graphing calculator. So number one, 3 to the x power equals 81. Now before we figure out what the value of x is, we're going to convert this to a logarithmic form. So this is base 3 exponential form, so it'll be log base 3. Whatever the exponent is, that's what the logarithm is equal to. So this will be log base 3 is equal to x. Then what's the argument of a logarithm? That's what the exponential expression is equal to. So this is log base 3 of 81 equals x. So these two statements are exactly the same. Now to be able to figure out what the value is of x, it's what is the exponent on base 3 that will give you 81? That's the same thing as saying, what is log base 3 of 81 equal to? What's the exponent on the base that will give you 81? And it's 4. Part 2. 5 to the x power equals 1 divided by 125. So to convert this to a logarithmic expression, so this is base 5 exponential expression, so it would be log base 5. Whatever the exponent is, that's what the logarithm is equal to, so it equals x. And then 1 divided by 125, that's the argument of the logarithm. So log base 5 of 1 divided by 125 is equal to x. Now again, to figure out what the value of x is, what is the power on the 5, base 5, that will give you 1 divided by 125. It needs to be negative 3. Now part 3, 64 to the x power is equal to 4, so this is the exponential expression. What is the equivalent logarithm expression? So it's base 64 exponential expression, so it'll be log base 64. 4 is the argument of the logarithm, because that's what the exponential expression is equal to, and the x is the exponent, so that's what the logarithm is equal to. So log base 64 of 4 means what is the exponent on base 64 that will give you 4? Now we know that if you have a fraction power, that's actually a root, a radical. So what type of root on 64 will give you 4? It has to be the cube root. So that means x must be 1 third. 64 to the 1 third power, or exponent, gives you the cube root of 64, which is 4. So x equals 1 third. So you might be wondering, how do you evaluate these values of x if you have a graphing calculator? Well, you need to use what's called the change of base formula. The change of base formula says that you can change the base of a logarithm to a different base using this formula. Log base a of some number m 
is equal to, so I'm going to change this logarithm from base A, whatever that number A is, to a new base, which is called base B. So you take log of the new base, base B, of the argument, so log base B of M, and then you divide by log base B of the old base, and that's in the denominator. So how can you use a calculator to help you evaluate these? There are two different types of logarithms that are built into any graphing or scientific calculator, and they're on the left-hand side. So you have log, and you also have ln. Log is a log base 10 logarithm, and this ln, the natural log we talked about in the previous video, it means log base e. So if you want to change to any base, you can use the calculator to change to base 10 or log base e, and then you can calculate the values. Let's use the formula for our first problem. We had log base 3 of 81. So if you want to use the change of base formula, you would have log base 3 of 81 would be log base, let's say we change to base 10, it'd be log 81, close the parenthesis on the logarithm or the argument, and then divide by, you would use log base 10 of 3. So log of 81 would be log base 10 of 81 divided by log base 10 of 3, and that's equal to 4. So that's exactly what we had in part one. We needed to have base three raised to the fourth power to get 81. But you might be wondering, can't you use the natural logarithm as well? Yeah, you can. You can change to any base that you want. So if you want to change the log base e, you would use natural logarithm. 81 was the argument divided by natural log of the old base was three. And if you calculate this, you also get four. So it doesn't matter if you use log base 10 or log base e, you can use either one on the graphing calculator if you use the change of base formula. So now that we know how to convert between exponential to logarithmic form, we're going to talk about the properties of logarithms. So these are very useful in simplifying the argument of a logarithmic function before we actually find the derivative in the next video. So the properties allow us to either write the logarithm as a product or a quotient as a sum or a difference of different logarithms. So properties of logarithms, for each of these properties, x will be positive, y will be positive, b is the base, it must be positive, and the base cannot be 1, then we have the following logarithmic properties. Number one, it's called the inverse law. It's giving you an example of how does the logarithm and the exponential functions inverse one another. Log base b, so that's a logarithm, b to the x is an exponential expression, so you have log base b of b to the x. It's asking, what is the power on b to get b to the x? It has to be x. That's why the logarithm base b and the exponential expression base b kind of just simply cancel or simplify each other out. And you just have what's left over is the exponent x. Number two, another inverse property. You have base b, exponential expression, and then in the exponent you have a logarithm, log base b of x. So again, the logarithm and the exponential expression sort of simplify each other out. So you have base b and log base b, they cancel each other out, and what's left over is what's inside the logarithm called the argument, so just x. Now, the next three logarithm properties are if you have a product, a quotient, or a power inside the argument of a logarithm. So number three is called the product law. What if you have log base b and you have a product inside the parentheses making up the argument of the logarithm? Then you can separate this product into a sum of two different logarithms with the same base. Log base b of x and then plus log base b of y. So a product inside the argument changes into a sum of logarithms. Number four, the quotient law. You have log base b of a quotient or a fraction. You have x in the numerator and y in the denominator. Again, you can separate these out if you have a quotient inside the argument as a difference of logarithms. Log base b, so again, same base, of x, that's the numerator, subtract log base b of the denominator. Now again, with subtraction, the order is important. So you must have log base b of the numerator, which is x, and then you subtract log base b of the denominator. If you reverse the order, the answer will be the opposite sign. So number five, the power law. What if you have a power that makes up the argument of a logarithm? We actually used this in the previous video. If you have log base b of x to some power, we know that the power can be brought to be a coefficient of the logarithm. So the r can be brought down. It's not to be confused with the derivative. It's just a log property. So you, then you have r times log base b of x. And then number six, the change of base formula we just previously talked about, you can change log base b of x to any other new base. So this is log base b. If I want to change it to log base 10 or log base e so I can use my calculator, you can do log base 10 of x, which is the argument, divided by log base 10 
of the old base. Or natural log of the argument x, so natural log of x in the numerator, divided by natural log of the old base, natural log of b. So in addition to these six properties, there are two additional properties that we're going to be using with logarithms, and they can be derived using property number one. So number seven, log base b of one is always equal to zero. It doesn't matter what the base is. The base will be positive, but not equal to one. Otherwise, if you take log base any base of one, you will always get zero. Now, why is this true? Property number one, log base b of b to the x was x. That was property number one. So if you replace the x with a zero, then you have log base b of b to the zero power. Well, b to the zero power is just one. So log base b of one, that's zero. Number eight, log base b of b is one. So in other words, if the base of the logarithm and the argument are exactly the same number, then you get one. So again, this is by property number one. Log base b of b to the x was equal to x by property number one. If you make x one, then you have log base b of b to the first power, which is just log base b of b. And so if x is one, then this logarithm is equal to one. So now that we've talked about properties of logarithms, we're going to talk about how can you use calculators or computers to evaluate logarithms with base 10 or base e. So for example, let's say we want to evaluate log, and if there is no base indicated, that's assumed to be a 10, so log base 10 of 800, log is on the left-hand side of the calculator towards the bottom, so log base 10 of 800, close parenthesis on the logarithm, the argument, and you come up with 2.903 when you round the three decimal places. So log base 10 of 800 is 2.903. So what that means is that base 10 raised to the 2.903 exponent is about 800. Or if you want to use the natural log, it's the button that's right below the log. So ln is the natural logarithm. This is a log base e logarithm of 800. Now the reason why you get a different answer is because this is asking what is log base e of 800? What is the power on base e that it takes to get 800. If you take base e and raise it to the 6.685 power, it will be approximately 800. And then again, if you want to use the change of base formula, if you have any other base besides base 10 or base e, you can change the base, but you have to use the change of base formula. So let's say you have log base 7 of 800. You can use log base 10, or you can use log base e when you change the base. So if you use log base 10, so you have log 800, that is log of the argument, then divide log of the old base, which was 7. So log base 7 of 800 is approximately 3.435. In other words, if you take 7 raised to this exponent, 3.435 is approximately 800. Or, say you don't want to change the base 10. You can change the base e and use the natural logarithm instead. So let's say you use natural log. You can do natural log of the argument, 800 and then divide by natural log of the old base, and you still get the same answer, 3.435. So the two different types of logarithms that show up on the graphing calculator or a scientific calculator are what's called the common and the natural logarithms. The common logarithm is the logarithm with a base 10, and it's written as log of x, so log of x. The base is not written, so it's assumed to be a 10. The natural logarithm is a logarithm with base e, and it's written as ln of x. So it will be natural log of x if it's written in that form. So example two, using logarithmic properties. Use the properties of logarithmic functions that we had earlier to expand each logarithmic expression as a sum and a difference of logarithms and have all powers written as factors. In other words, use the product, quotient, and power laws. Number one, let's say you have the expression y equals three times log of 12x subtract four times log base 11 of seven divided by x. So notice in the first logarithm, you have a product, 12 times x in the argument, and the second logarithm, you have a quotient inside the logarithm that makes up its argument. So you can use the product law with the first logarithm to simplify, and you use the quotient law with the second logarithm. So if you do that, you'll have y equals three. Now make sure you have parentheses because we're gonna rewrite this logarithm as a sum because we're gonna be using the product law log of 12x, this is base 10 logarithm, so log of 12 plus, because we're using the product law, log of the other factor, which was x. Then keep the sign between the two logarithms, so subtract 4 
Now we're going to rewrite this log base 11 of 7 divided by x using the quotient law. So the quotient law said log base 11 of a fraction is log base 11 of the numerator, so log base 11 of 7, then subtract log base 11 of x. So again, this goes in parentheses because we're rewriting that one logarithm into a difference of logarithms. So now why is it important to have parentheses? Because we want to have 3 distributed to both logarithms. This was 3 times 1 logarithm. We took this 1 logarithm and wrote it into a sum. So this 3 needs to be distributed to both logarithms. So negative 4 was outside this logarithm. It was negative 4 times log base 11. So negative 4 needs to be distributed to both of the logarithms that we rewrote it as. So when you do that, you'll have 3 times log of 12, 3 times log of, of x, subtract 4 log base 11 of 7, and then negative 4 times negative log base 11 of x will be plus 4 log base 11 of x. And now the logarithms are simplified. You have just 12 inside the first logarithm, just an x, just a 7, and again, just an x. No products, no quotients, and no powers inside the logarithm. Number two, g of x is 7 times x to the fifth. Now, that's not a logarithmic function. It's a polynomial. Subtract 4 log base 8 of square root of x. So the first thing that we need to do is rewrite the square root of x so that it's a fraction power. So 7x to the fifth, leave that alone. Subtract 4 times log base 8. The square root of x we know can be rewritten as x to the one-half power. So now notice that you have a power inside a logarithm. You have log base 8 of x raised to an exponent, so you can use the power law. So the power law says you can take the one-half, the exponent, and bring it down and make it a coefficient for the logarithm. So g of x can be rewritten as 7 times x to the fifth, subtract 4 is already the coefficient, so 4 times we brought the exponent down, so 4 times a half now, log base 8 of x. And now if you simplify, 7x to the fifth is fine, Negative 4 times half is negative 2, and then you have log base 8 of x. And then number 3, you have y equals 8 times log base 2 of 3x plus log base 10 of e to the 7th power. Subtract 3 times natural log of a fraction, 5 divided by x. So again, we need to use the log properties to simplify the arguments because we have a product inside the first logarithm, we have a power inside the second logarithm, and then we have a fraction inside the third logarithm. So when you use the product law, the power law, and the quotient law. Let's say you use the product law first. So this first logarithm can be rewritten, use the product law. You have 8 times quantity, log base 2 of 3, plus, because we're using the product law, log base 2 of x. So the second logarithm, you have a power inside the logarithm as part of its argument. So then you can use the power law. So 7 is the exponent. It can be brought to the front to be a coefficient. You have 7 times log of e. And then the third logarithm, you have minus 3. Now we're going to rewrite this third logarithm so it's a, a difference of logarithms because we're going to use the quotient law. You have natural log of the numerator, natural log of 5. Subtract, because it's the quotient law, natural log of the denominator, natural log of x. Now just like we had in, in part 1, you need to distribute the coefficients through the parentheses now. So you have 8 times log base 2 of 3. That's 8 times log base 2 of 3. You have 8 times log base 2 of x. So 8 log base 2 of x. Then you have 7 times log base 10 of e. And then the negative 3 needs to be distributed through the last set of parentheses. So negative 3 times natural log of 5. And then negative 3 times negative natural log of x gives you positive 3 times natural log of x. So now notice, you don't have any like terms because the logarithm needs to be the same base and the argument needs to be the same so you can combine them. One of the most important properties about logarithms that we had previously listed actually helps us solve exponential equations. So here's the procedure that we're going to use for solving exponential equations. So number one, you need to isolate the exponential expression whenever possible. Number two, you always take the logarithm on both sides of the equation. Three, use the power law for logarithms to pull the variable out of the exponent because that's where a variable will be located if it's an exponential equation. And then place the variable as a coefficient of the logarithm. And then number four, Use algebra to solve the resulting equation for the variable. Example 3. Solving exponential equations. Solve the following exponential equations. If necessary, use a scientific or graphing calculator to round your answers to three decimal places. Number 1. You have 5 times e raised to a power, negative 0.3 times t, and this is equal to 2. 
So notice you have an exponential expression on the left-hand side because the variable is in the exponent. So you need to solve for t. So this makes it an exponential equation. So the first step says you need to isolate the exponential expression. So how do you do that? You have 5 times an exponential expression. You need to divide both sides by 5. That way you have just e raised to a power on the left-hand side. So when you do that, you have 5 divided by 5 on the left-hand side. They'll cancel out. So you have e to the negative 0.3t left over, and it's equal to the right side divided by 5 gives you 2 fifths. So e to the negative 0.3 times t is equal to 2 fifths. The second step said, take the logarithm on both sides of the equation. Since we have base e exponential expression, we want to use log base e, or the natural logarithm. So take the natural log on both sides of the equation, natural log of the left side, equals natural log of the right side of the equation. Why do we want to use the natural logarithm? Because natural log is log base e, and this is base e raised to the negative 0.3t. We have the inverse property that says natural log is log base e, and you have base e on the inside of the argument. They cancel each other out or simplify. So you have negative 0.3t left over, and it equals natural log of 2 fifths. And now the last step. You want to use algebra to isolate the variable that you're solving for. So notice we have negative 0.3t, that's just it, no logarithms, no exponents anymore. You can divide both sides of the equation by negative 0.3, the coefficient for t. And so that will cancel out the left-hand side, negative 0.3 divided by negative 0.3 will cancel out. So you'll be left over with just t, and it equals, do the same thing on the right side of the equation, natural log of 2 fifths divided by negative 0.3. And now use a graphing calculator to approximate what this answer is. So t is equal to natural log of 2 fifths, so natural log 2 divided by 5, close the parentheses on the logarithm, divided by negative 0.3. So this is approximately 3.054 when you're rounded three decimal places. Number two, you have 3 times 10 to the x plus 4 exponent equals 40. So again, first step is to isolate the exponential expression. The exponential expression this time is 10 to the x plus 4 power, or exponent. So you want to divide both sides of the equation by 3 first. So divide the left side of the equation by 3. That will cancel out the 3. And now do the same thing on the right side of the equation. You have 40 divided by 3 on the right-hand side. So 10 to the x plus 4 is what's left over from the left-hand side of the equation. And it equals 40 divided by 3. So now just like the last problem, notice that this is 10 to an exponent, x plus 4. We can use the inverse property of logarithms if we use log base 10. So use the common logarithm. So the common log on the left-hand side, log of 10 to the x plus 4 is equal to, again, make sure you use the same type of logarithm, log base 10 of the right-hand side of the equation, 40 divided by 3. And now again, the reason why we're using log base 10 is because of the inverse property. Log base 10 of 10 to the x plus 4, they undo each other because they're inverses of each other. So you have x plus 4 is all that's left. So x plus 4 is equal to log base 10 of 40 divided by 3. And now, again, use algebra to isolate the variable. So if you want to get x by itself, subtract both sides of the equation by 4. So x is equal to log base 10 of 40 divided by 3, and then subtract 4. In the graphing calculator, you would use log base 10, this time instead of natural log, 40 divided by 3, close the parentheses on the logarithm, and then subtract 4. So x is equal to approximately negative 2.875 when you round to three decimal places. So let's solve one more exponential equation. Number three, you have five to the two x minus one in the exponent plus six equals 80. So again, isolate the exponential expression first. So five to the two x minus four, that's your exponential expression. So subtract six on both sides of the equation first. So you'll have five to the two x minus one is all that's left on the left-hand side. 80 subtract six gives you 74. So now notice you have base 5 exponential expression. It doesn't actually matter which type of logarithm you use. You can use log base 10 or natural log. In this case, the logarithm and the base 5 won't cancel each other out. So we'll have to do something a little bit different. So let's use natural log this time. If you take the natural log of the left-hand side, you have natural log of 5 to the 2x minus 1 exponent is equal to natural log of 74. Now notice you have base 5 exponential expression and you have log base e, because that's the natural log, they don't undo each other. They're not inverses of each other. So you have to actually use the third step in the procedure for solving exponential equations. 
you need to use the power law. So the power law said, if you have an exponential expression, you can take the power and make it a coefficient for a logarithm. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to take this 2x minus 1, bring the whole thing down, and make it a coefficient. 2x minus 1 in parentheses times natural log of 5 is equal to natural log of 74. Now notice, with the power law being used, the x is no longer an exponent. It was in the exponent, but we brought it down. So now you just have 2x minus 1 in parentheses times natural log of 5 equals natural log of 74. Solve for x. So you can divide by natural log of 5 because this is being multiplied here. So 2x minus 1 times natural log of 5, divide by natural log of 5, they'll cancel each other out. But do the same thing on the other side of the equation. Natural log of 74 divided by natural log of 5. And so after the left-hand side cancels out, you have 2x minus 1 left over, and it equals natural log of 74 divided by natural log of 5. Now solve for x. So you need to add 1 to both sides of the equation. So 2x is equal to natural log 74 divided by natural log of 5 plus 1 after you add the 1 over to the right-hand side of the equation. And now how do you get x by itself? You divide everything by 2. So 2x divided by 2 will cancel the 2 out. But then divide the entire right-hand side of the equation by 2. So x is equal to natural log of 74 divided by natural log of 5. Then you add 1. And then you divide everything by 2. So let's see how you can enter this in the calculator. So you have to be a little careful on how you enter this in the graphing calculator. So you want to make sure that you divide natural log 74 divided by natural log of 5 first. Then you want to add 1, get that answer, and then divide by 2. So to do that, make sure the numerator is in parentheses. So parentheses first, natural log 74, close the parentheses on the logarithm, then divide natural log of 5, so natural log 5, close the parentheses on the natural log of 5. Then you want to add 1. So this is adding 1 after you divide. Close the parentheses on the numerator. That way you'll have the answer to the numerator. And then divide by 2. So this is approximately 1.837 when you ran the three decimal places. So let's see how you solve exponential equations inside applications. So example 4, the population of India. The population of India in billions t years after 2008 is given by the exponential function f of t is equal to 1.14 times the quantity 1 plus 0 0.0134 but then the parentheses is raised to the t exponent. So this is an exponential function because the variable is t and is in the exponent. If the population continues to grow following this trend, when will the population reach 2 billion people? So since this function represents population of India in billions, we want to find out when is this function equal to 2 billion. So we get an exponential equation. We have 1.14 times 1.0134 after you add like terms inside the parentheses, raised to the t exponent, and that where is that equal to 2? So to be able to solve for t, which is an exponent, we need to use logarithms. So the first step in solving exponential equations is to isolate the exponential expression. So notice that 1.14 is not part of the exponential expression. So divide both sides by 1.14. So you'll have 1.14 times the exponential expression. Divide by 1.14 will cancel 1.14 out. But then do the same thing on the right side of the equation. 2 divided by 1.14. So the left-hand side is now the exponential expression isolated. 1.0134 to the t exponent is equal to 2 divided by 1.14. Now, the base is not base 10 or base e, so you can pick what logarithm do you want to use. I'm going to use the natural logarithm, but I'm going to have to use the power law. So take the natural log of the left-hand side of the equation. So natural log of 1.0134 to the t exponent is equal to natural log of this fraction, 2 divided by 1.14. Now, since the logarithm doesn't cancel out with this base, you need to use the power law. The power law says you can take the exponent, which is t in this case, and bring it down to make it a coefficient. So t times natural log of 1.0134 is equal to natural log of this fraction, 2 divided by 1.14. And now notice, since t is no longer an exponent, you have t times this logarithm. You can divide by the logarithm to isolate the t. So divide both sides of the equation by the logarithm. So divide by natural log 1.0134 on both sides of the equation. That way they cancel each other out. But then to do the same thing on the right side of the equation. 
take natural log of 2, divide by 1.14, and then divide by natural log of 1.0134. And then you'll have t is equal to natural log of 2, divided by 1.14, then close the parentheses on that logarithm, and then divide by natural log of 1.0134. So with the graphing calculator, you would have natural log of 2, divided by 1.14, close the parentheses on the, the logarithm in the numerator, then divide by the natural log that appeared in the denominator, natural log of 1.0134, and close that parenthesis on the argument. So you get approximately 42.23. If you round to three decimal places, you will get 42.23. Now what does this mean? The population of India will reach 2 billion people 42.23 years after 2008. So in addition to solving exponential equations inside applications, you can also have logarithmic expressions that come up in application problems too. So one particular application of using the logarithmic expressions is with the pH scale. So example five, the pH scale. In chemistry, the pH is a measure of whether a liquid is either an acid or a base, and it's related to the concentration of hydrogen ions, which is represented this way, so square brackets, H positive, measured in moles per day, by the equation, pH is equal to negative log, and it's base 10 because there's no base identified, so log base 10 of the concentration of the hydrogen ions. So part one, if a liquid has a concentration of 0.0001 moles per liter, then what is the liquid's pH level? So if the number of moles per liter is 0.0001, then we can use this formula to calculate the pH level. pH is the opposite of log base 10 of 0.0001, the number of hydrogen ions. And so you come up with negative, this is log base 10, so use the common logarithm, 0.0001, it's four. So the pH scale for this liquid would be four. Now part two, determine the hydrogen ion concentration of a liquid with a pH level of seven. So if the pH level is seven, you can replace pH with a seven in this equation, and so now it's a logarithmic equation. You have seven is equal to negative log base 10 of the concentration of the hydrogen ions. So now isolate the logarithm by itself. So notice the negative one times logarithm, you want to divide both sides by negative one. So seven divided by negative one gives you negative seven. So negative seven is equal to log base 10 of the concentration of hydrogen ions. Now, how do you solve this logarithm equation? you want to convert to an equivalent exponential equation. So this is log base 10, so it's 10 to this power, what the logarithm is equal to, negative seven, so 10 to the negative seven exponent is equal to what's inside the argument of the logarithm. So the concentration of the hydrogen ions is equal to 10 to the negative seven, or 0 0.000001, and this is moles per liter. So the last thing that we're going to talk about in this video is about the graph of a logarithmic function and the domain of a logarithmic function. So here are some of the graphical features of a logarithm function. So if we have the function g of x is equal to log base b of x, so the base is b, the base must be positive but not equal to 1, the x, we're going to talk about the argument in a second, the graph of this logarithm function has a horizontal intercept at 1 comma 0. Now how do we know this? because we had a logarithm property earlier that said log base b of one was equal to zero. So if you plug in one for your x, your y value will be zero. So the logarithm function will pass through this point, one comma zero. So we see that with the graph. No matter what type of logarithm you have, log base two, natural log, log base e, or the common logarithm, log base 10, all three of these pass through the point one comma zero as the x-intercept. Another property that all three graphs have is that each of them have a vertical asymptote at x equals zero. So x equals zero is the y-axis. So you have this dashed line that's not part of the graph, but the graph gets really, really close to the vertical asymptote as you get closer and closer to x equals zero. So all three of these graphs get closer and closer to this vertical line, but never actually touch or cross it. So that means we have a vertical asymptote at x equals zero. Another thing about each of these graphs is that the function is growing from left to right. So the function's increasing. So as I go from left to right, all three of these graphs are rising from left to right. So the function is increasing, and it looks like the graph is concave down. The graph is bending downwards. The domain of the function is x must be a positive number, 
or 0 to infinity in parentheses. So x was the argument of the logarithm. So what's inside this logarithm must be a positive number. So I can only plug in positive numbers into this logarithm to get a y value back. So notice the graph does not exist on the left-hand side of x equals 0. It looks like the graph gets really, really close to the vertical asymptote, but then that's it. There's nothing on the left-hand side of the vertical asymptote. That's because the domain is I need to have whatever I plug in for x, I'm taking a logarithm of a positive number. On the other hand, though, the range of the logarithm function is the set of all real numbers. Notice the graph goes down forever, and the graph will rise as I go to the right forever. So I'm using all y values that's making up the graph. So negative infinity to infinity, all real numbers. So whenever you're sketching a general logarithm function with base b, it's always helpful to start with these two points. The so x-intercept is 1, 0, so a logarithm must pass through this point, 1, 0. But the logarithm graph must also pass through b, 1, because if you plug in b, you have log base b of b, and we know that's 1. All right, last example, example 6, domain of a logarithmic function. Find the domain of the following logarithmic functions and write your answers using interval notation. Number 1, f of x is equal to log base 5 of 4 subtract 7x inside the parentheses. So that's the argument. So 4 minus 7x, whatever this number turns out to be, must be a positive number for the logarithm to actually give you a y value or an output value. So 4 minus 7x must be greater than 0. So this gives you an inequality that you can solve for x. So if you solve for x, add 7x to both sides of the inequality, you have 4 is greater than 7x. And now to isolate the x, you can divide both sides by 7. So 4 divided by 7 is greater than 7x divided by 7, or just x. So if you want to rewrite this, 4 sevenths is greater than x says the same thing as x is less than 4 sevenths. These mean the same thing. So how do you write this using interval notation for the domain? The x values that I can plug into this logarithm must be less than 4 sevenths. So the domain would be negative infinity to 4 sevenths, but not including 4 sevenths. So it's using a parenthesis on 4 sevenths. And then number 2, the function g of x is equal to natural log of negative 2x plus 5 inside the parentheses, and then negative 7 on the outside of the parentheses. Keep in mind, it doesn't matter what type of logarithm you have. What matters is the argument must be a positive number. So in this case, negative 2x plus 5 is the argument of the logarithm. So negative 2x plus 5 must be a positive number, so it must be greater than 0. And so now you can solve for x again to find out the domain. So subtract both sides of this inequality by 5. So negative 2x is greater than negative 5. And now the next step, divide both sides of the inequality by negative 2 to isolate the x on one side. So negative 2x divided by negative 2 will help you cancel out the negative 2, so you'll have x left over. Do the same thing on the other side of the inequality. Negative 5 divided by negative 2 will give you positive 5 halves. But then you have to remember, if you ever multiply or divide both sides of an inequality by a negative number, you need to reverse the inequality symbol. So notice it was greater than, so now it's going to be less than after you divide by negative 2. So x is now less than 5 halves, or 5 divided by 2. So how do you write this domain using interval notation? Well, it's all the x values that are less than 5 halves. So negative infinity to 5 halves, parentheses, because you do not want to include 5 halves in the domain. So this finishes our video on the review of logarithmic functions. If you have any questions about any examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about derivatives of logarithmic functions.